Hi, my name is Suryan Yoon. I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Cultural Studies at Lingnan University here in Hong Kong. Um, I'm trained in the fields of performance studies and dance history, and those are the primary areas where I uh, research and also teach. Uh, more specifically, my research interests um, currently are at the intersection of performance, contemporary performance to be exact, uh, and racial politics in South Korea and um, in the broader East Asian context. Um, my teaching more broadly includes modern dance history, um, globalization, racial politics and choreography, um, theater methods, as well as performance theories with specific attention to um, the larger sort of context of cultural um, studies, concerns, as well as cultural practices in the um, the broader Asian context. So we've transitioned online, um, not necessarily due to the current global coronavirus pandemic, but um, since November last year, uh, we transitioned online because of the um, anti-government protest related disruptions in Hong Kong. Um, there wasn't enough discussions, preparation, debates around um, the best practices, especially with regard to um, translating and transitioning performance-based teaching uh, into an online form, especially on our campus at Lingnan University, uh, it was really up to each professor, each faculty member to come up with their own form or practice to, um, you know, really kind of think of uh, what would be the best way to kind of uh, improvise and adapt. And I, I would really certainly call this entire process a, a form of collective improvisation. Um, both teachers and uh, students have been just like when we're improvising in theater and dance, relying on each other and adapting to the situation that's been changing day by day, really. Uh, and so having said that, I've had some time to revise my syllabus and my strategies in class where I would normally hold one lecture session and the um, another performance practicum session where we would sort of uh, process dense uh, performance studies theories and uh, conceptual framework through forms of embodiment uh, such as through you know, basic choreography or through um, you know Boalian image uh, theater or um, uh, forms of uh, gestures, sculpture, um, uh, script reading, etc. And so because we could not congregate to do that since last year and it's been six months already, uh, my students have been doing what I would call DIY performance and so I would give them each week a prompt or a set of questions that would guide them to creating a short performance or uh, uh, one that would encourage them to come up with uh, their own scenarios or scripts or um, imagine a form of uh, mise-en-scene or you know certain aesthetic components of a particular performance. Um, another thing that we've been doing is to really spend some time on reading performances very closely. Uh, and by reading, I mean really paying attention to movements, the sceneries, um, various spatial components of the performance. Um, because I think it is a case where when we congregate to perform together, do a performance workshop together, uh, we don't necessarily have time to process what our bodies are doing, what other people's bodies are doing, what we're doing uh, in terms of communicating with our surroundings, etc. And so uh, this is really the practice of 
what scholars Dwight Conker or D. Stoney Madison call deep sensing, right? Uh, deep paying attention to others. Uh, and so what we do is to simply sometimes stream a performance work from my computer uh, or to watch a performance work that's already available on social media platforms uh, and really do maybe 20 minute 30 minute round of discussions and we don't just exchange our opinions uh, although that is one of the more important kind of components of that practice but really the exercise is to kind of push ourselves to articulate what we're observing what we're seeing uh, how we're paying attention to the bodies that are moving uh, on the screen uh, and by extension, I'm hoping that that would also encourage the students to pay attention to what's going on around them, right? Not just within the performance, but uh, around them, either at home or outside. Another hack um, I would uh, like to talk about is uh, doing a dramaturgical portfolio. Um, again, uh, and this is an exercise that I have been doing since 2016-17 um, where students are asked to create a portfolio of their uh, research or um, uh, materials that they've gathered, notes, um, results of their brainstorming as if they're dramaturging, right? They're acting as a dramaturg for a particular adaptation of a performance and so at the end of that project, you're not actually staging a performance, but you're actually sort of pretending, right? You're, you're supposing you're going to stage something and you're serving as a dramaturg for that particular performance. Uh, and so what that does is to um, really kind of help students refine their research skills and also understand the very complex, very convoluted concept of what a dramaturg does, either for a theater production or a dance production. Uh, and it's a it's both a creative process, but also a very rigorous research process because they're conceptualizing um, the basic structure of the performance they're interested in uh, adapting. Um, because they're collecting materials, because they're establishing relationships between the adapted performance and um, the sociocultural context, etc. And so they're doing a lot of work um, collecting, writing, um, rearranging, and creatively producing something out of it. And so those are some of the hacks that I have developed. Uh, and applied to the classes once I've transitioned online. Uh, having said that, I think one of the more important things to remember uh, at this point in this process is not to expect too much from the students, but also from yourself, right? From ourselves as um, teachers, uh, because I think the pressure to be adaptable so much to this changing environment and the pressure to be um, always creative, right? Um, and that's been kind of the mantra, I, I feel like uh, that's been repeated over and over again, right? Things are changing, we have to be creative, we have to adapt to the situation. I think that alone becomes a burden. And so I think um, one of the, the things that I have to kind of remind myself is to kind of slow things down, um, really let everyone pay attention to uh, things that are unfolding very quickly around them. That's really the point of all of these exercises that I've been developing in class. Um, right, so uh, I, I don't really have any concrete answer to how might I envision um, what this sector will change uh, if, if we're talking about performing arts sector more broadly. Um, what, what I can actually point out is that I would expect to see a lot of new debates or renewed interest in old debates 
around uh, liveness and presence and mediation, but more importantly, what you know, socioculturally specific context or activities might condition one's liveness, the idea of liveness very differently. I say this because um, I've quickly realized that the performing arts sector or performance studies discipline uh, uh, for that matter, how it responds to the situation is very different and should be very different um, depending on the kinds of sociocultural situation that we're in. Once again, because um, Hong Kong students have been dealing with months long protests, uh, which are actually uh, becoming close to a year now because the first round, first series of protests actually happened, um, started, began to happen June last year. So it's actually, um, we're, we're approaching the first anniversary mark. Um, and so in this particular situation, not only the COVID-19 pandemic sort of makes our bodies vulnerable, makes the idea of congregating and assemb you know, an active assembly very dangerous or lethal, but at the same time, politically, Hong Kong students have also been made very vulnerable. Their bodies are exhausted, right? The idea of getting outside, uh, being present all the time, being alive, uh, attending to liveness uh, is in and of itself becoming an exhausting act, right? Because their bodies are uh, always on the streets, uh, and, you know, they put their lives on the line. Uh, the images of their bodies are always mediated, circulated uh, by uh, major news media outlets and on social media. And the images of the bodies, right, the protesters' bodies being clubbed or maimed or arrested, um, there's so much saturation, right? The overwhelming uh, bombardment of uh, bodies everywhere, right, has actually been an exhausting thing, uh, which makes one's sort of approach to thinking about liveness actually very vulnerable and very risky. Uh, and so I would I would hope and I would demand actually that you know the debates around these specificity, cultural specificity, social sociopolitical specificity would unfold uh, more in the coming months, if not coming years. Um, I am also sort of thinking that our sector or our, our field rather would pay more attention to the changing living conditions of um, teachers, students, as well as um, cultural workers within the field, right? We, we tend to forget that in order to perform, we realize so much on the cultural workers who are tending to the maintenance of the stage, um, the venue, uh, the, the team of people who kind of mobilize and recruit and uh, work with and uh, reach out to the audience members, um, the cleaning staff, right, the maintenance staff, the technical managers, um, et cetera, et cetera. And so while we're talking about physicality, uh, uh, on which we rely so much in terms of creating learning and teaching performance, I feel as though uh, we should also be paying equal, if not more, attention to how this liveness is also sustained, how the conditions for this physicality is also sustained in the conventional space of theater performance and dance. Uh, and you know, for those of you who have been already following the news, uh, even the most established institutions are now beginning to put their uh, non-essential staff, staff members on furlough, which is a huge deal. And so uh, if we're beginning to see some changes, uh, we might be also seeing debates around um, government fundings, um, institutional relationships uh, with performance itself. Uh, and also if, you know, some of the institutions, right, the, the um, opera companies or uh, theater venues or uh, more larger sort of uh, performing arts venues are streaming their works, um, how does that actually affect in terms of the copyright and prop uh, sort of the, the 
artworks work as a property, right? How does that actually affect the ownership of artists? So all of these kind of provocations should probably be um, uh, the the driving force, right? The vector behind uh, some of the changes that we're already seeing in the sector.